Buenas tardes, geólogos, ingenieros geólogos, señores y señoras, bienvenidos al Servicio Geológico Colombiano. Nos place contar con la presencia de todos ustedes. La tarde de hoy nos convoca la presencia del presidente de la Comisión Estratigráfica Internacional, profesor Stan Finit, quien ha sido invitado por el proyecto Mapa Geológico Colombia de la Dirección de Geociencia Básica del Servicio Geológico Colombiano. Enseguida tendremos dos charlas dirigidas por el profesor Stan Finit. La primera, The International Commission on Stratigraphy, 50 Years of International Collaboration and Cooperation. La segunda es The Anthropocene Epoch, a Scientific Decision or a Political Statement. Les agradecemos su colaboración apagando celulares y equipos de audio o programándolos en modo silencio. Esta conferencia está siendo transmitida simultáneamente a las regionales del servicio geológico y grabada en esto en, en atrás. A continuación presentaré el orden que se dará la tarde de hoy. Primero, himno nacional de la República de Colombia. Segundo, palabra del doctor Oscar Paredes Zapata, director del Servicio Geológico Colombiano. Tercero, charla denominada The International Commission on Stratigraphy, 50 Years of International Collaboration and Cooperation. Cuarto, charla denominada The Anthropocene Epoch, a Scientific Decision or a Political Statement. Cinco, sesión de preguntas. Sexto, tenemos un refrigerio. Iniciando con la agenda programada para el día de hoy, primero, nos invitamos a ponernos de pie para escuchar las notas del himno nacional de la República de Colombia. Es 
el cuerpo científico más antiguo y más grande de la Unión Interamericana de Ciencias Geológicas, por sus siglas eh, IUS. Welcome to Polycom Conference Recorder Playback Service. El objetivo principal de esta comisión es definir con precisión las unidades cronoestratigráficas de la tabla cronoestratigráfica internacional, las que a su vez son el referente material de las unidades geocronológicas en la escala internacional del tiempo geológico. Esta escala es la responsable de darle color a las unidades de los mapas geológicos y también en el marco fundamental del tiempo que se usa para expresar la historia de la Tierra. Para nosotros, Servicio Geológico Colombiano, es un honor contar con la presencia del presidente de esta comisión, el señor Stan Fine, es profesor en paleontología, bioestatigrafía geológica de campo y de problemáticas ambientales de la Universidad de California en el Departamento de Ciencias Geológicas de eh, la Universidad del Estado de California en Long, en Long Beach, Estados Unidos. Él trabaja activamente en temas como la parte de extinción en masa del final del Ordovídico, que ha sido la cuarta de la mayor importancia en la Tierra, paleobiología y biostratigrafía de Gravitolites. Paleogeografía, eh, historia geotécnica de la precordillera argentina. Estatigrafía y estructura en las montañas eh, Roberts del norte y del centro de Nevada. También trabaja activamente en temas de cronoestatigrafía. De hecho, durante la dirección del de, eh, señor Fine y en la subcomisión estatigráfica del Cordobí, se determinaron de probar y ratificar todas las series y los pisos del sistema ordovísico, que junto con el clúrico y el devónico son los únicos sistemas que han sido definidos en su totalidad. Por último, el profesor Finde se encuentra trabajando en la revisión de la guía sobre todo lo concerniente al capítulo de cronoestatigrafía. Stan Finde fue el presidente de la Subcomisión Estatigráfica del Ordo en 1900, de 1996 al 2004 y gracias al conocimiento que tenía tanto de los principios estatigráficos como de las actividades de las subcomisiones que trabajaban en las definiciones formales del precámbrico al neógeno, fue nombrado vicepresidente de la Comisión Estatigráfica Internacional del año 2000 al 2008 y desde el 2008 asume el cargo de presidente de la Comisión Estatigráfica Internacional. También ha participado en la Comisión de Nomenclatura Estatigráfica de los Estados Unidos. Con relación a la segunda presentación del profesor Fine, merece mencionar eh, unas palabras. El antropoceno es un tema de debate intenso. Ustedes, los geólogos, vienen en esa discusión en el mundo y en la comunidad científica, no solo entre la comunidad de las ciencias de la Tierra, sino en los medios de comunicación y las personas del común. Actualmente, el antropoceno es una denominación informal de una época geológica que ha merecido incluso la publicación periódica en algunas revistas científicas. Las actividades del ser humano cambian el paisaje, los océanos, la atmósfera y los ecosistemas, incluso a escala espacial, de tal forma que ha emergido como un agente que cambia el sistema de la Tierra. En concordancia de la premisa fundamental del antropoceno es que las actividades humanas dejan un registro geológico comparable al de otros grandes eventos en la Tierra. Entonces, la pregunta que debe formularse es si se merece que ese antropoceno ser formalmente establecido por la Comisión Estatigráfica Internacional y ser incluido en la escala del tiempo geológico. Pues esperamos encontrar alguna aproximación a esta respuesta en la conferencia de Stan que nos va a dar el día de hoy. Hoy conocemos conoceremos la postura del de profesor en torno a este debate. Para finalizar, la presencia del profesor Fine en Colombia va más allá de la presentación de estas dos charlas. El profesor se encuentra con nosotros para establecer formalmente la Comisión Estatigráfica Colombiana en cabeza del Servicio Geológico Colombiano, que es la entidad líder y eh, eh, correspondiente con las disposiciones legales en este tema. Eh, en los distintos foros en que hemos estado participando en las últimas reuniones, 
siempre se ha hecho mención de la necesidad de que el servicio geológico retome esa actividad de liderazgo en el tema de la comisión estatilar. Entonces, qué mejor oportunidad que darle reinicio a esa comisión, restablecer su importancia para estandarizar y homologar el lenguaje, la presentación y unificación de todos los informes geológicos en particular o asociados a la industria del petróleo en temas de la Comisión Estatigráfica Colombiana con la presencia del presidente de la Comisión Estatigráfica Internacional en el mundo. Bienvenido, profesor Fine a Colombia, bienvenido al Servicio Geológico. Hemos tenido ya oportunidad de dialogar con él un rato en la mañana, de disfrutar a la hora del almuerzo un delicioso ayaco, y hablar un poco de Colombia, de playas, de su entorno, y esperamos que en una visita de campo que inicia mañana en la zona de Huaté, en la zona de Villa de Leiva, pues puedan apreciar parte de los registros geológicos que evidencian lo que esta tierra hace millones de años como estaba conformada el compuesto. Bienvenido, profesor, y te escuchamos con interés sus palabras. Gracias, doctor Paredes. Tercero, charla denominada The International Commission on Estatigraphy, 50 Years of International Collaboration and Cooperation. Ahora le damos la bienvenida a Colombia al doctor Stan Philip, presidente de la Comisión de Estatigraphy Internacional. Gracias, Jorge, y muchas gracias, director General Zapata. Uh, señores y señor, mi español no es bueno y quiero dar mi conferencia en español. Probablemente estaré en español y lo voy a en inglés. Uh, tu país y tu ciudad es muy bonito. Me gustó mucho. Y soy feliz, muy feliz de estar aquí. Y también estoy muy... Uh, para mí es un honor grande uh, hablar sobre el Comisión uh, Estratigrafía. Uh, porque uh, he trabajado en las actividades de la Comisión para muchos años. Y la... El trabajo es muy importante y las personas trabajando en la comisión uh, están científicos muy buenos. Uh, ah, también vengo, vengo trayendo regalos. Es la estación de Navidad. Y, uh, están productos de, de Comisión de Estratigrafía con la Comisión de uh, Mapa del Mundo. Y esto, uh, la memoria de, de ustedes uh, han descubierto, yeah, es una uh, tarjeta de memoria. Sí. Push, empuje aquí. <risa> Hay mucha información en este tarjeta, mucha información sobre ICS y sobre la comisión uh, de mapa teórica de un mundo. Ok, en inglés. La primera conferencia es, es larga porque quiero explicar uh, mucho los archivos actividades de la Comisión. El segundo sobre el Anthropocene es nuevo para mí. Daré una conferencia sobre el Anthropocene por la primera vez aquí. Okay. Ah. The Commission on Strategy. Estuve, estuve fundado en 68 y esto los uh, directos presidentes de la comisión por los años y tengo un gran placer estar asociado con estos uh, primeros uh, presidentes. The 
commission consists of an executive of a chairman, myself, vice chair, and secretary general, and 16 subcommissions, all of them except one based on the geological systems, and a subcommission on stratigraphic classification. Each subcommission has approximately 20 voting members, and each focuses on defining units and boundaries of the U International Chronostratigraphic Chart for their particular uh, systems. The Commission on Stratigraphy also produces uh, products such as the charts you see, as well as articles on stratigraphy and the International Stratigraphic Guide and the subcommissions where the greatest part of the work of the commission is done produce many other products and have many workshops, symposia, and field meetings and carry out field investigations. This is the primary product. This is the international chronostratigraphic chart. This is what the commission on stratigraphy has as its primary objective to establish a single hierarchical set of global chronostratigraphic units at the rank of stage, series, and system. Now, when we use these terms to talk about the past and the history of the Earth, we talk in terms of time, and those are the geochronological units the period, the epoch, and the age of equivalent rank to the system, series, and stage. And that's an important dis distinction. We work in the Commission on Stratigraphy in establishing units based on rocks present today that one can get, go and stand on, one can map, and one can sample. When we use the time term, we are talking about the past, although we often refer to rocks in terms of the time that they form. Also, when one talks about these units in terms of time in the past, and especially when we try to calculate the numerical ages of the boundaries between the units, then we have what's called a geologic time scale. That is based on the International Chronostratigraphic Chart, and that's an important distinction that I will talk about when I talk about the Anthropocene. On this chart, you'll see the units, but you'll also see these little symbols. These we refer to as golden spikes, clave oro. It's analogous to when the railroads were built across the United States from the east and west, and when the tracks met in the center of the country, they used a golden spike as the last spike to hold the rails together. And in a sense, the golden spikes here also mark an important monument. They are the global standards that define the units of the International Chronostratigraphic Chart. Now, this terminology was first established, as you can see, at the Second International Geological Congress in 1881. Two sets of units. The terms have changed somewhat, but these are the rock names, system, series, and stage, and the equivalent time terms, period, epoch, and age. You can see that the units of the of chronostratigraphy, of geologic time, have evolved through time. They have a history. As geologists first in Europe began studying rock units and giving them names by which to refer to them, and then interpreting their relative order of formation, this became the geologic time scale. But note that it has evolved through time. When these units were established, they were established primarily on bodies of rock, such as what became the Carboniferous, or the Cretaceous, distinctive lithologies that occurred over a large area, but with the realization 
that the succession of fossils was most valuable in establishing age relationships among these rock units. They became defined on the basis of fossil content or biostratigraphy. Now I emphasize the units were named on the basis of outcrops with distinctive fossils, but their boundaries were never were not defined. That created a great problem. You can see this illustrated here with the boundary, the history, the boundary between the Silurian and Devonian systems. This was a situation in the 1960s. The Devonian system and this underlying Silurian were defined in Great Britain. The Silurian was defined first by Murchison, and the primary fossils in the upper part of the Silurian were graptolites, and these show graptolite zones here. Names. Above that was the terrestrial, continental, non-marine sandstone, the old red sandstone. But Murchison and Sedgwick discovered that in southern England, Cornwall and Devon, there were marine limestones underlying the Carboniferous. They interpreted them to be younger than the Silurian, and thus they defined the Devonian system on marine rocks in southern England, but consider them time equivalent to the old red sandstone. Murchison then went to continental Europe and found outcrops of marine limestones with fossils similar to those in southern England, and he recognized these rocks as his Devonian system. And he continued his explorations, but later geologists over the years, working farther to the southeast in Europe, discovered shelly phases with graptolites that extended higher up than the highest graptolites in Britain. The British had always defined the top of the Silurian as the extinction of graptolites. So this is the situation in 1960. Where is the Silurian Devonian boundary? The British had always placed it here, this bed, at the base of the sandstones. They had also placed the top of the Silurian at the extinction of graptolites. But here in southeastern Europe, graptolites went up much, much higher. So what's the boundary? Some people would put it there, others would put it here. You see different interpretations on where it should be. 1960. Geology was expanding explosively as a science, with studies of the ocean floor, the origin of continents and mountain belts, and putting them in a plate tectonic context. And look at the nature of our fundamental time scale. It was greatly efficient. It was not up to the standards of modern science. So a major effort was launched. The first thinking on this, you can see, was developed in 1948. It was to focus on defining boundaries between those units, between time stratigraphic units chosen and carefully selected, internationally agreed, bedding claims of a type locality with fossiliferous and green deposits. Thus, it was the concept of a benchmark, a golden spike, a boundary stratified, or what we call GSSP. And the thinking at that time, as you can see with this publication, a big problem was the boundary between the Pliocene and Pleistocene, which was long, very controversial, led to incredible arguments, but was finally resolved by the Commission on Stratigraphy in 2009. This is a situation by which the traditional units were defined. Based on, this is showing at the rank of stage, Stages were defined based on rock units with distinctive fossil content. They were placed in superpositional order, but often they were not, successive units were not in continuous stratigraphic sections. They were in different localities. For example, the ammonite zones for the Jurassic of Dorbini and later Opal were all from individual separate quarries or road cuts or small outcrops. They were placed in a stratigraphic order. Each was characterized by its fossil content, but boundaries between the units were not defined. 
And with later study of sections in many other parts of the world, it was found that some of these traditional units were found to have a gap between them. In other parts of the world, strata were found that would fill in this interval. Yet there's the type for stage C, there's the type for stage D. There's a bound, there's a gap between them. Where is the boundary between them placed? In other instances, it was found that two successive units defined in two different areas actually overlapped, such as with the Silurian and Devonia. Where is the boundary? No boundary was defined. So the decision was made to pursue a program of defining the boundaries of the global units at all ranks using the GSSP, Global Stratotype Section and Point concept. Namely defined sections that span two successive units, continuous section, fossiliferous, and today we require other kinds of stratigraphic signals such as isotope excursions, or paleomagnetic reversals. And in that section that's chosen, it's called a stratotype, a single leg level is placed at which to put the boundary. And that then serves as a definition of the boundary between successive units. It actually serves as the lower boundary of the overlying unit. And as such, it typically then serves as the upper boundary of the underlying unit. So the program was launched, and this chart shows some of the problems. Initially, as this program began, it used biostratigraphy. Magnetostratigraphy was not well developed. Chemostratigraphy was not developed at all. And both of those techniques really required that the rocks first be dated with fossils before those tools can be used for correlation. What we have with fossils is they represent life on the earth in which there's great paleoecological and paleogeographic differentiation. And that's illustrated here. Here, the vertical axis is time. The horizontal is geography from land, positive areas, depositional basins, shallow appearing seas, inner shelf, outer shelf, slope, and ocean floor. And different fossils with different mythologies accumulate in each of these settings. An important part of the GSSP project is try to find a section in a facies with fossils and other stratigraphic signals that allow the boundary to be placed that provides the best available and reliable correlation across the greatest range of facies, depositional settings, and geography. So no perfect boundary can be found, but by having formal definitions of the boundaries, we can do a much better job in defining units and correlating them than was possible in the past. The Silurian Devonian boundary was the first one for which there was a decision made. Here you can see a recommendation presented in 1968. The boundary between the Silurian and Devonian systems Shall be, shown, shall be chosen in relation to the base of the monographic uniformist sum. And the committee on the boundary shall now proceed to study localities where a suitable, suitable boundary stratotype may be defined. And they did. They traveled all over the world looking at candidate stratotype sections and evaluating them. As you can see, there was a lot of controversy. The British surely didn't want the boundary changed from where they had it at the base of the old red sandstone. People in other countries considered that to be a problem. The committee is of the opinion the boundary should be defined now. There will always be arguments for delay, but the history of where the boundary has been placed in the past shows that only an authoritative international decision can end the existing confusion. And that began this program, long term, of defining all boundaries. This is the publication of the full report of the whole process and all the data from all the sections that were studied and how the decision was arrived at. Here was a section chosen in the Czech Republic in a quarry. That bed right there includes the lowest occurrence of the graphite monographic uniformis, 
as well as other stratigraphic signals. There are many other graptolites in the section. There's another graptolite zone below the boundary. This particular trilobite that occurs on many continents always occurs just above the lowest occurrence of that graptolite. There's also detailed continental biostratigraphy through that section that's consistent with other sections worldwide. Now that's the definition of the boundary. The key though is that there are these other stratigraphic signals in the section to help with correlation elsewhere. And it became standard starting with this GSSP is that a marker be placed on the section. The section is actually up here in the quarry or the GSSP right about this level. This is a monument that was built for it. And if you stand in a designated site in front of that and look right through here, this lines up perfectly with the boundary on the hillside. And for anyone that wanted to do more modern studies with new techniques on that boundary interval, this is the section they go to to do that work. Now, I will show you another problem we have with stratigraphy that hinders geologic studies. It's a complex problem. And the objective of ICS is establishing a single set of standard units to overcome this problem. This is the Ordovician world. Continents were greatly dispersed around the equator. Gondwana extended from the equator to the South Pole. Within those seas, marine faunas, especially the main index fossils, the graptolites and conodonts, showed great geographic differentiation as well as paleoecological differentiation. The Ordovician was first defined on rock sequences and fossils in Wales. Well, because of that paleogeographic and paleoecological differentiation, those species that occur in Wales don't occur elsewhere in the world on other paleocontinents. As a result, the definitions of the subdivisions of the Ordovician and even the boundaries, look at the lower boundary, have varied between continents and also through time. Our British colleagues had the base of the Ordovician at this level until 1995, whereas the Australians had it at this level, China and the United States, it was at that level. This is a system, the Ordovician, Cambrian Ordovician boundary, and look at the different interpretations of where it lay. Again, suppose you're a structural geologist mapping and trying to reconstruct structural history and you do want good age control and units to express the ages of the events, especially those near the boundary. What scheme will you use? How well will you correlate with colleagues in other countries or in other continents? The problem's worse than that. Here's North America. There's the Ordovician originally. Three different series, Canadian, Champlain, and Cincinnati. Here it is today, by Bexie and by Rocky and Mohawkie and Cincinnati. In a sense, our, our language has evolved. And here's even greater complexity. This is at the level of stages. Again, picture yourself not as an Ordovician specialist, and you're working with Ordovician rocks. You want to express what you have in terms of chronostratigraphy and thus then in terms of geologic time. What a complex mess. What the Commission on Stratigraphy did was realize that the traditional British series that were so long used just could not be recognized well on other continents. And it was necessary basically to start again, to throw out all of these units, define a lower boundary of the system, an upper boundary of the system, and entirely new subdivisions. And here's the result. Again, this shows the various stage nomenclatures on different continents. Here's what we end up with today. The Ordovician has three series, lower, middle, and upper, composed of seven stages. <coughs> the boundary of each stage is picked in a section, listed here, at a level in the stratigraphy that is well marked that provides the best level for global correlation in the Ordovician. Those are the eight best levels throughout the Ordovician from the bottom to the top for global correlation. 
as this project began, the first step was four division stratigraphers on every continent created correlation charts for the entire continent and looked at all the biostratigraphic information to find these levels for boundaries, but also to determine what each stage or series would incorporate within them. Many people, especially our British colleagues, complained about the loss of the traditional British series that everyone knew. But what I point out is the British series had evolved themselves, as you can see. They were changing. And the new units have been so well accepted that at the International Symposium on the Ordovician System in 2011, four years after this was finished, <coughs> only one paper out of 120 used the British series. All the other papers used the new global units. So it's accepted almost immediately. People will still say, I work in structural geology in Argentina. There they use the British series. Your new, new units create a problem for me. Well, look at this wonderful chart the Board of Vision Subcommission has produced. If you're used to the British series, you can see how they correlate into the new stages. You have a chart of, like this on your table, and there's no problem. You can also see how the units of the different major paleogeographic regions correlate. And for local work within one continent, the regional stratigraphic units best reflect the stratigraphy and can still be used. The global units are for international communication. And as you can see here for the Ordovician, those global units are now further subdivided and into that has been correlated an incredibly well-constructed chemostratigraphic record for the Ordovician. This could not have been done without biostratigraphic correlation, but also standard units into which to correlate. <coughs> now, selection of a GSSP. A proposal put forward for a GSSP is evaluated in terms of several criteria. No single GSSP will ever meet all these requirements, but we expect most of them to meet these requirements, or to, to meet most of the requirements. Here are the two main ones. The fossil content should be abundant, distinctive, well-preserved, and represent fauna and or flora as cosmopolitan, as diverse as possible. Why? To provide worldwide correlation rather than just regional correlation. And to ensure its acceptance and use in the Earth sciences, a boundary stratotype should be selected to contain as many specific marker horizons or other attributes favorable for long distance time correlation as possible. And that would include paleomagnetic reversals and chemostratigraphic excursions. There's a process, an elaborate process, for approving a GSSP. I am of the opinion that this process, as well as the criteria on which proposals are judged, gives legitimacy to these decisions as global standards and wide acceptance within the earth science community. Here is the process shown here. A GSS proposal usually comes out of a subcommission or a task group within the subcommission. It is considered boundary levels, has considered candidate stratotype sections, and finally makes a recommendation of what's the best level in the best section. It goes to the subcommission for approval. There it is discussed and evaluated, and the voting members vote to approve it. It's rejected unless it receives greater than 60% majority vote, what we call a super majority. If it receives a supermajority vote, it's forward to the Commission on Stratigraphy. And there, the same process is repeated. The voting members, as you see here, evaluate the proposal, discuss it, and have a vote. And if the proposal receives greater than 60% majority yes votes, it's forward to the IUGS Executive Committee. They review it primarily to see if proper 
procedures and guidelines were followed. And if so, if they vote to approve it, it's considered ratified. It must be published, preferably in the journal episodes, and a uh, marker must be placed on the GSSP. So this is a very elaborate process, but this is what we consider necessary to give legitimacy to the international geo standards that we are developing. Here is the history of ratification of GSSPs. The first one, the Sonoran Devonian Boundary in 1972. There were quite a few here in the 1980s. I marked them as being for the Silurian because I'll show you at the end of my presentation, these were done too quickly. They were placed in Wales because Wales was Murchison's type area for the Silurian, but the sections are not good. Those GSSPs have proved to be unworkable, and now they're having to be reconsidered. Now we're progressing at one, two, some years four approved each year. And this year we're approving two. There are approximately 100 GSSPs to be defined for the entire ICS chart. And at this time, approximately 50 have been ratified. Typically a GSSP is illustrated like this. Here's a section, there's the level. The lowest occurrence of this species is taken to define it. That's a poor concept of what the GSSP is in the stratotype section. For various reasons, in other sections, the lowest occurrence of that species <coughs> could be significantly different. How can you tell that? There may be many reasons. It may have migrated here to this location much later. Maybe it existed here but was not preserved. Maybe the people collecting the section did a poor job collecting it, did not find it here even though it occurs there. But we have procedures for evaluating one of these stratigraphic signals and how well reliably one can correlate it to the other sections. It's called homotaxy, order of appearance. As you can see in this diagram, this is showing geographic distribution at time. A species evolves, migrates to other areas which take time. One species after another. But you see this species here arrives there much later. So you have an anomaly in stratigraphic order of appearance. These three and four are fine, but this one is a problem. So if a stratigraphic signal is used for correlation, Correlation is an interpretive process correlating a level from one section of rocks to another. It requires evaluating the data and not just the lowest occurrence that's used to define the boundary, but that lowest occurrence relative to other stratigraphic signals in those sections. Here's an example. This is from many sections I worked on in the Appalachians. Those are the ranges of graphite species. I'll focus on this level here because it serves as the base of the upper war division series as well as the sand bean stage, which is the lowest stage of the upper war division series. It's picked here at the lowest occurrence of this distinctive graptolite, Nemograptus grossless. But what I'd like to point out is a distinctive assemblage of species here, many of them dying out, but beginning right here, you have the first species of a new <coughs> genus appearing, Decelograptus. There's another species of it. There's another species right here. Oh, right there. There's another species. There's another species. There's this incredible evolutionary explosion in the genus Decelograptus in the interval in which Nemograptus grossus first appears. Also, there's a portland Conerma first occurrence just below that level. Here's the data from a section. You can see how intensely it was sampled. Here's the interval in which the species of Decelograptus appear and diversify. Here is the occurrence of Nemograptus subtius that we consider the direct ancestor of Nemograptus grossless that occurs right there. The Conrad zonal boundary is about this level that I mentioned. So we have a number of stratigraphic signals. 
What's important here is not just the signal and the level defining the boundary, but it must be viewed in context of all the stratigraphic signals in the boundary here. You see, this is in western China. Here's another section. There's the interval in which the diselograptids, decelograptus diversifies. Here's the level of the lowest occurrence of Nemograptus rostrus. We go to Wales, long section. Here's where Decelograptus evolves and diversifies. There's the lowest occurrence of Nemograptus rostrus way up there. It's much later. Although the boundary for the base of the upward nutrition series was defined at the lowest occurrence of Nemograptus rostrus, the stratotype section, we would correlate that boundary to here because of these many more stratigraphic signals that characterize the boundary interval. And we would say, locally, this is a late occurrence. But you can see the sample the section is very long. There is very long covered intervals with no exposure. There's very few collections in the interval. So I just emphasize that all the signals in the boundary interval are important. Some stratigraphers early on said, oh, we just put a spike in the ground, that's our definition of the boundary, and then we correlate it. But what's required today is before a GSSP is approved, not only has a level been selected, but it's already been correlated to many other sections, so its value for correlation has been demonstrated. So what we say is, does definition precede correlation? No. Correlation must precede definition. And correlation always involves interpretation. Here is a section in China, stratotype section, for the base of a new stage, Jinshanian stage, of a new, that's in a new series for the Cambrian Ferongian series. The Cambrian subcommission is doing what the Ordovician subcommission did ignoring all the local regional units and creating a new set of units. The lower, this unit, this stage, is defined as boundary level in this section at the first occurrence of this trilobite. I think it's that one right there. But you can see it occurs in an interval with many other stratigraphic signals, other for lowest occurrences, other highest occurrences, to evaluate correlating that level into sections and other parts. Here is the boundary between the Jurassic or Triassic and Jurassic. This one was just ratified in 2010. It's defined on the lowest occurrence of this ammonite in a section in Austria in the northern Calcareous Alps. You'll see that in that section and other sections in the world, there are also other stratigraphic signals, and they're also in the section is prominent, distinctive uh, chemostratigraphy in terms of carbon isotopes. <clears throat> this interval does not have a lot of fossils, but the key is that the level it was chosen at the lowest occurrence of that ammonite in this section separates above it all species that have been all parts of the world that were considered Jurassic from those that were considered Triassic. So it fits with the long-established uh, consensus on the position of the boundary, and it can also be characterized by this distinctive chemostratigraphy. And now the dedication. This is the fun part. This is what I like. Okay, This is the section with the base of the Ordovician here on the coast of Newfoundland. There's our golden spike. All we did there was a place a monument. This is in China. This is the level defining in this section the base of the Middle Ordovician series and its lowest stage called the Dipingia. Now the Chinese take great pride, national pride, in having international geostandards located in their country. And you can see that in the ceremonies they have when these are dedicated. You can see they built this platform. This is a sculpture of the species of Conodon at which the boundary is placed. And we had many politicians, this man here, no, this man here, Vice Minister of Lands for China, 
and head of the Chinese Geological Survey. He came from Beijing, from Beijing with an entourage of maybe 50 people. And with the politicians come the journalists to make it a very special event. This is a special section for me. It's a beautiful area in a wonderful country. It's at Sumaya in El País Vasco, the north coast of Spain. It's an incredible section, as you can see from the outcrops. We have GSSPs for two stages in the Paleocene in that section. Again, there was a great dedication ceremony. You can see the group there, and there are lots of journalists, because the politicians are there. This is the governor of the province, the mayor of the town of Zumaya, the head of the Paleogene Subcommission <coughs> who made the initial decision, the leader of the team that investigated the section, EO. <laughs> And this outcrop area, this beach, is in a nature preserve, natural biotope. It's in a geopark. It's also in a beautiful beach that many people go to for bathing, surfing, sunbathing, every day that they can. And you see, an educational plaque was put up as part of the GSSP dedication. Here you can see the section, it's incredible, because here is the KT boundary, <coughs> one of the best in the world. Here is the interval of the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum, one of the best studied sections in the world for that event in Earth history. Here's the level of the two GSSPs. All this through here is the Paleocene, completely, perfectly exposed. I get a chance to talk to the governor. I tell the governor, this is valuable. You have to maintain this. You have to protect this. Journalists are there. It's a big event. The politicians love this. It's the best part of their job, dedicating ships, GSSPs, new projects. There's the golden spike, one of the best golden spikes I ever seen. It's all made. Here it is being pounded in at the boundary level. And there's the plaque that marks the GSSP. There it is in the rocks. It's cemented in place so no one takes it. And this rock hammer, this rock hammer is in a, como se dice, a neo para llaves. The hammer is. And here is the marker in three languages, the Basque language, Castellano, English, designating this as a GSSP. And finally, the real purpose of the dedication ceremony is to celebrate the work of this team. These are the scientists that investigated that section, studied the magnetostratigraphy, the biostratigraphy, the cyclostratigraphy, they did astronomical tuning, they looked at sequence stratigraphy, they compared this section to others in the world, and they prepared the proposal that was finally approved. And it's their day to celebrate. They had been working many, many years, and finally they enjoy recognition for all their hard work. And of course, with the journalists, their stories for the public begin to understand the nature of the geologic timescape. Okay, the Alps. This is Triassic, they're overturned, Jurassic. The boundary interval is in here. This is carbonate, this is carbonate, this is mudstone. That boundary interval was time, the time of the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province, which pumped large volumes of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, so the carbonate sedimentation ceased for a period of time. And the boundary was always traditionally placed in this level. Here up on a high ridge is a section that had been exposed and studied. 
and selected for the GSSP. This is Axel van Hildebrandt, the, lead, the leader of the team that investigated this and wrote the proposal, pounding in the golden spike. Because it's mudstone, it has to be a little stronger. And there the cap is put on the top. And of course, there's a celebration. <laughs> China, as I said, takes great pride. The most famous GSSP is that that marks the boundary of the Permian and Triassic systems. It's a time of the greatest mass extinction. Yes, you're looking, these are models of the Conodon species used to define the boundary. It's a geopark, and there's a museum with the park that's made here. The, the boundary level is right here. It extends all along this mountain and the cliffs. This is a big column with the Conodon defining the boundary at the top. There's a very large museum there. The boundary is actually right in here. And this boundary is so important, not just for the mass extinction, but within that section, there are a large number of bentonite beds with zircons that allow that boundary to be more precisely dated than any other boundary in the entire geologic column. Here you see an excellent example of cyclostratigraphy, probably governed by Milankovitch cycles. These are Miocene and Pliocene sediments deposited on the floor of the Mediterranean and uplifted recently and well exposed on the south coast of Sicily. You can see the cycles and how the cycles are grouped into sets. This is the Mycenaean evaporites which were deposited when the Mediterranean dried up completely, or nearly completely, during the Miocene. And they show cyclostratigraphy within them. Well, those cycles can be astronomically tuned to the orbital, orbital parameters of the Earth system, and they, how they affect the heating of Earth's atmosphere and thus Earth's climate, which then control the sedimentation in the Mediterranean basin during that time. And look what we now put together, at least for the upper part of the geologic column, in terms of information to date our stratigraphy. This section first had to be identified roughly its age on the base of biostratigraphy. And what you see here are columns of zonations for planktonic foraminifera and calcareous nanofossils. This biostratigraphy then allowed the paleomagnetostratigraphy to be correlated into the section. And those magnetic reversals were already dated based on sections on land and on seafloor anomalies. This allowed the investigators to determine the duration in years of this section. Here you can see the cycles repeated cycles. It was possible then to tie these cycles in the stratigraphy into Milankovitch cycles. And in doing so, it was then possible to date every one of these cycles with a precision of 24,000 years. And that's in rocks that are two, three, four million years of age. That's an incredible precision in giving numerical ages to rocks in the field. Not just dating one level, but dating every single bed with that kind of precision. Our international stratigraphic chart. I'll show you the controversy with the quaternary and the Pleistocene. Here is a chart distributed in 2000 at the Geological Congress in Rio. A Neogene, Neogene quaternary. Four years later, the ICS chair produced this chart. You can see there's no quaternary. The neogene was extended to the present. That was the opinion of a small group of people that made that change arbitrarily. And the world of quaternary stratigraphers went ballistic. Where is our quaternary? The argument was that when the Pliocene-Pleistocene boundary was defined with the GSSP at that level, that numerical age, the working group decided not to call it the Neogene Quaternary Boundary because there was differences of opinion on where that boundary should be. 
that boundary was picked at this section here, Ohio Pleistocene, this section in southern Italy, and fossils that were the first indication of climatic deterioration in the Italian sections. <coughs> okay? So to indicate the onset of the cooling for the Pleistocene glaciations. But later it was discovered through analyzing <coughs> sediment in the North Atlantic on the seafloor and looking at the oxygen isotope fluctuations that the real swings in isotope ratios that began to get larger and more positive indicating cooling in the Northern Hemisphere actually began in 2.6 million years. And so the quaternary workers wanted the boundary to be at this level. You'll see that's below the Pleistocene. They wanted the quaternary at this level, the base of the Gelasian stage and the top of the Pliocene. It fit with massive ice sheets and glacial hills in North America. It fit with the Luce deposition in China. It fit with glacial facies and faunas in Europe. And it fit with changes in ocean circulation at this level, but not at this level. There were proposals received and argued, as you can see here, on how to resolve the problem. The new team people wanted to keep that extending to the present. That would just make the quaternary a subsystem. The quaternary people said, no, no, we want it down here with the Pleistocene down here. The traditional level had been here, though this boundary had not been defined. So finally, the decision was made after a lot of discussion. A vote was taken by ICS, and it was approved at this lower level. At the base of the Gelasian stage, here's the Gelasian stage in Sicily. And the boundary that I'm marking there is right at this level in that section. So we've reestablished the quaternary. It wasn't done authoritatively by the chair of the Commission on Stratigraphy. It was done by all the voting members thoroughly discussing and evaluating the different positions and then voting overwhelmingly to make this choice. And although a small group was very angry about <coughs> this, this decision has now been accepted by the greater Stratograph community. Okay, what else does ICS do? It produces the International Stratigraphic Guide, so there should be a new one. It's the last one was published more than 20 years ago. It'll probably be five or ten years before a new, another one is produced. The subcommissions have many activities, such as field workshops to look at candidate GSS pieces uh, sections, to have symposia every four years that brings together scientists that focus on that particular system. The Quaternary Subcommission has produced this kind of product, an incredible correlation chart of all the information, or the vast majority of the information dealing with the quaternary in this case. We have information for magnetostratigraphy, biostratigraphy, the oxygen isotope stages, the stratigraphy within the Chinese Lewis, within Lake Baikal, Lake Bed sediments, the glacial stages, all brought together in a beautiful chart. And if you're interested in this, or the ones on the Ordovician, they're available on the ICS website. The Commission of Stratigraphy has also organized groups to publish articles on these different stratigraphic techniques. They're not like the guide that just focuses on nomenclature and process. These articles explain <coughs> the subdiscipline and most importantly give case examples of how it's used or applied. Eventually, these will all be put together in a single book. If you're interested in them, contact me, and I'll be happy to send you PDFs of these articles. The latest one to be produced is Mammoth, Sequence Stratigraphy. There's different opinions, different concepts of sequence stratigraphy, but we had an international team of well-established sequence stratigraphers work together to come up with a consensus document on sequence stratigraphy. We produced a chart in other languages, Castellano for Spain, but of course in Spain there's three languages, 
So, oh, is that sideways? We have a version in Basque. We also have one in Catalan. We have one in Portuguese. My Spanish colleague is working on a chart for all the countries, uh, Latin America. But, you know, Colombians are different than Chileans. So, he has yet to resolve how they have Again, people like to see numbers, the ages of the boundaries. And what I'd like to show you is that is an art. When you see the numbers on the chart, the numerical ages, those do not define the units. The GSSPs define the units. Putting numbers on is a calibration. Except for the Permian-Triassic boundary and possibly one other, there are no volcanic ash beds in the sections with the GSSPs. And often in sections with volcanic ashes, there's no fossils or magnetostratigraphy or chemostratigraphy to use for correlation. There are some places, though. But although these numbers are often shown with great precision, that's a false sense. Because just an example, the Ordovician system here, there are one, two, three, there are about eight or nine uranium-led ages in 40 million years of strata. None are in sections with GSSPs. I take that back. Those are the Ordovicians. The Ordovician Silurian boundary section has volcanic ashes. So that is a, a trick in how the numbers are put on the chart. It includes quantitative stratigraphic techniques. These are all subject to change and revision. Going to the Precambrian. The Precambrian was subdivided into units based on what are called global standard ages because there is no biostratigraphy. But today, Precambrian stratigraphers, or a community of them, want to define these units with GSSPs. They feel these numerical ages are not useful in the field working with rocks and expressing geologic history. This has begun in a way with the definition of the topmost part of the Precambrian as the Idiocaran system, with the GSSP defined here in this section in Australia. There is distinctive fossils in the Idiocaran, but in addition, there's distinctive from the cryogenian Distinctive global glacial deposits succeeded, always overlaid by a distinctive carbonate unit called a cam carbonate, with a distinctive isotopic composition. And that level is considered to be a globally, represent a global event that can be correlated widely, and it was chosen for the GSSP. We have a cryogenian subcommission. The cryogenian, the base was arbitrarily placed at 850 million years, but now based on their work, they want to include just the gla global glaciation events, and they have asked that this number and this level be raised to 720 million years. We're voting on that. Time. So, the Commission of Security has to website. It's tied in with an incredible database system where anyone and managing will put into the database that will keep confidential for you, and that includes a variety of tools for quantitatively synthesizing and interpreting that data. We have our charts and time scales. We have a table of GSSPs. Those are the global standards established by ICS, and the archive for them is here on this website. We also have an abridged version the International Stratigraphic Guide. The Commission on Stratigraphy is more than 300 voting members among the executive and the subcommissions from approximately 15 countries. We collaborate with UPA, Commission on the Geologic Map of the World. Many ICS members participate in IGC projects. They're on national stratigraphic commissions and editorial boards of numerous journals. We collaborate with the IUGS Commission on Geoscience Information, with One Geology, 
the geoparks, the geoscience programs, UNESCO, and I'm the IUGS. During its 47 years, ICS has generated a huge body of stratigraphic information for the entire geologic column from hundreds of sections worldwide. We've established this global chronostratigraphic framework for the geologic column with more than 50 of the units of the 100 units defined by GSSP. This work has stimulated significantly advances in biostratigraphy, and of course that requires studies of taxonomy, paleoecology, and paleogeography of the index fossil groups. It stimulated development, testing, and refining of magnetostratigraphy, chemostratigraphy, and spectrostratigraphy with astronomical tuning. And it's encouraged the development of modern techniques in isotope geochronology by providing well-defined chronostratigraphy in which to integrate radiometric updates. I mentioned the problem with Silurian. You know, this is where a poor GSSP was done, many of them. There's no exposures in Wales. Murchison did a fantastic, incredible job of piecing together the stratigraphy from the Silurian from many separate small outcrops. But this is, you see, is a problem with the GSSPs that they placed there. Their concept was drive a golden spike in the ground and correlate it to it. This is the base in here, the GSSP for the base of the Homerian stage of the Windlock series. Lewis said that there's a bentonite bed here and it's 80 centimeters above the bentonite. There a graptolite was found, a single specimen of a single species that's not well identified. That's what they base the boundary definition on, saying that the boundary occurred at the base of the Graptolite zone. The Graptolite zone has a worldwide distribution, but when you have one specimen, you don't know where you are in that zone. And in this case, if you go 80 meters centimeters above the detonite, is where the Graptolite was found, what this is is the soil that overlies the outcrop. It was a loose piece of shale on which the GSSP was defined. So the British colleagues resisted it for many years, but finally they forced the issue, and now all of those GSSPs are being reevaluated, and new ones will be proposed for sections with good outcrops, lots of good fossils, magnetostratigraphy, and chemostratigraphy within them. These did not work. Our charge. There's still a lot of work to do. The work is done in subcommissions. Some are making great progress, others not so great. But we are moving on. And the next thing we're faced with is this. This proposal hasn't been put in the sales except in the newspapers. But the Anthropocene should be a new epic, reflecting the impact of humans on your system. And that's the topic of my next presentation. Thank you so much.